Hi friend, welcome to the Dream Brave Podcast. I'm Waijia. No matter where you're at, God cares about the little and big dreams He's placed in your heart. But what happens when our loved ones and mentors don't agree with our dreams? Do we listen to them and drop our dreams or press on? I'd love to invite you on a journey with me where I challenge you to dive into scripture, call into remembrance what God has done in your life to put our faith in a God who's greater than we ever dared imagine. I'll be sharing parts of my journey and interviewing ordinary Christians like you and me with extraordinary faith, which I hope will inspire you to dream brave, even when you feel too small. Have you faced opposition from your loved ones when you share your dreams with them? How do you discern good advice from the naysayers? In this episode, I sat down with Pastor Jason Min from Citizens Church to hear his remarkable story of confronting and managing parental or mentor expectations when his brother and him chose unexpected career paths. As a Korean American at the intersection of Eastern cultural expectations meeting Western individualism, Jason gave great insights on navigating expectations and criticism and what to do when those we love don't support or agree with the dreams we feel God calling us to pursue. You're going to love this episode. Jason Min is the lead pastor of Citizens Church in Los Angeles, a Southern California native, Jason earned his BA in Communication and History at the University of Pennsylvania, his Master's of Education at Harvard University, and his MA in Theology at Fuller Theological Seminary. Prior to stepping into ministry, Jason pursued careers in education and music, and his five love languages are music, coffee, diet coke, golf, and the Lakers. Jason and his beautiful wife, Carol, whom I met recently, currently reside in LA with their two children, Avery and Jack. Jason, it is so good to have you today. Welcome to the Dream Break Podcast. It's so great to be here. So great to see you from all the way across the globe. Exactly. Isn't it crazy? Just a couple of months ago, we met each other in person. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, it's, uh, I still tell people of all the kind of providential connections I've experienced in my life, that has to be up there as, as one of the most kind of a connection that truly felt divinely kind of appointed in every yeah. way yeah why don't we un- tell tell our listeners a little bit about how we met because i personally feel it was just so crazy i'll share my bit and i'll let you share yours <laughs> yeah i mean what was uh so basically Waija reached out to me kind of cold reached out to me via email yeah um you know and she said it's interesting because i think on both ends Neither of us are used to that kind of interaction, period. You know, I think exactly. Waijan mentioned that she doesn't usually ever just cold email pastors. Um, yeah. She shared with me a little bit about her journey. Um, we had a mutual friend um, who she was sharing with me that she was recently baptized um, at her com- in her community. Um, someone I had known for a long time and who had been such a valued and integral part of our church community during the pandemic. Yeah. And yeah. I kind of had lost um, lost touch with her, but then to hear that she was baptized and and it become my close friend. Yeah, I mean that <laughs> it, that immediately caught my attention. You know, being a church in LA, um, you do get emails from pastors, missionaries, nonprofit presidents, you know, all the time. But that was an email that I just um, that stopped me in my tracks because. Wow. Um, you know, just because of our, our, our mutual sister who um, to hear such an amazing testimony of God's grace in her life. And so I read this email. I knew I wanted to connect with Waija. Literally the day after I read that email, got a random uh, Instagram DM from an old mm-hmm. seminary friend of mine. Shout out to Sam Lim if you're listening to this. But he says to me, hey, Jason, if you're, you know, if you're looking for a preacher or, you know, at your church, I don't know, like, you know, what you're kind of like, how you do your preaching schedules or things like that. You really have to connect with this woman. And she, he, he just shared Waija's page with me um, that said that she was also going to be in the States during a certain time period. And yeah. It was the same. I mean, I, I didn't. It didn't register to me at first that it was the same mm-hmm. person that I had received the email from, 
And when I when I figured that out, I mean, that was another kind of really in, uh, amazing connection. And then so we yeah. finally connected on Zoom. And this was yeah. kind of the third and most, it felt like God was just beating me over the head with, you know, like, I think you absolutely need to connect with Waija. Uh, I'm listening to Waija's story on Zoom and kind of we're maybe a month away from Waija coming to town. Um, our preaching schedule is usually set for the year. And I'm listening to Waija's story. And the only thing I can think about as she's sharing her story is the story of Jonah. And I'm oh. just like, wow, this is this is an incredible story, incredible journey testimony. And I'm thinking about it. Mm. And I'm I'm thinking to myself, oh man, like when she's here, I would love for her to share part of this story, share her journey oh. with our community and to preach for our church. At the time, we were going through a year-long sermon series called Childlike Wonder, where we're kind of revisiting a lot of the familiar uh, mm -hmm. stories we grew up with in Sunday school and yeah. kind of helping people reconnect with that childlike posture of, of awe and curiosity mm -hmm. in their pursuit of Jesus. And, you know, just out of curiosity, I was like, I wonder what the sermon scheduled for that day was. And I look it up on my computer and it's the story of Jonah. And that's crazy. And literally wow. I was like, Waija, you absolutely have to come and you wow. have to preach. And, you know, and she did. And our community was so blessed um, by her voice, by her story. And so, yeah. Wow. Jason, thank you so much. I, I'm getting goosebumps just hearing this story because, I mean, for the listeners listening in, it just felt so um, divine because like, like, like Jason mentioned, I never really write cold emails to like pastors <laughs> overseas. And this was really bizarre because it was a book tour and I had felt God had asked me to avail, you know, February 2nd to 21st. And what were the chances that on that exact weekend that I had I had available. Mm. Uh, I just felt this nudging that I had to write to Jason and I kept putting it off because I told myself, you know, don't be desperate. Don't do not do things that are so awkward, you know. But because of this friend that I had, it's a Singaporean friend who's just been listening to um, Citizen Church's online services. Uh, because of her, I got Jason's email. And when I finally wrote, it was just insane how God had already spoken to an Australian pastor whom I don't even know to Jason about me. And so when we met, it just kind of felt like a little bit like the stars colliding. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened that the volunteer PA that I had at the time, another Singaporean girl, like what were the chances? Like when I told her that Jason and I connected, she completely freaked out because she said she had attended school in Boston mm -hmm. together with Jason. So there was another connection. And I thought, God, this is really crazy. So Jason, it is so good to have you here um, with us. As much as you've said, I have um, been a blessing at Citizens Church. Um, you have been a blessing in my life because mm -hmm. I've never seen... Uh, it's funny that you said that when you heard my story, you immediately thought of Jonah um, because preparing for that message uh, really wrecked me because mm. for the first time in my life, I connected with Jonah. Mm. And like I, like I shared that day, unless we realize that we're running away from God, we can never see ourselves running back to him. Mm. Yeah. But Jason, I've just been so blessed by all your messages um, from Citizens Church. I listen to them on a regular basis. And something that has really intrigued me when we had a lunch together in LA in that beautiful coffee shop, and also from hearing all your messages, is that I've been so inspired by the journey that you've had to take. Mm. Um, I often hear you talk about, you know, your childhood experiences, your background as, an, as a Korean American, and the kind of challenges that you had to face. And also, you know, with I mean, you have an amazing educational background and leaving all that behind to start a church. I wanted to unpack that and ask if you could share with us a little bit about your background and how God brought you on that journey. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yes, I'm a second generation Korean American. Um, my parents immigrated here to the States right after I was born. So uh, around 1983 and, you know, being a first, an older son of immigrant parents just automatically comes with it certain cultural expectations. You know, mm. I mean, already there is kind of certain responsibilities that come upon the older son in, um, in Korean culture. But especially, I think, you know, when you have parents who really left 
their life and their future and a lot of their mm -hmm. dreams behind um, with the purpose of kind of creating a better life for for me and my younger brother. Um, you just grow up with this burden of I have to succeed, you know, um, wow. my family, um, you know, my parents, my grandparents, they're kind of they're banking on the fact that this experiment will, will pay work. off, you know, will work, <laughs> you know. And so in yeah. some sense, I think maybe you have two types of people, some who, you know, that that pressure crushes them, um, some who really just try their best to live up to those expectations. And I, mm -hmm. you know, I think I was the latter, you know, I was a rule follower, um, tried to please my parents at an early age. Um, I kind of internalized this message of Jason, like you, you are most valued when you are performing at your best or when you're achieving, you know, or wow. um, I internalized this message that said kind of you exist to make your parents and the people around you happy, you know? And I think, wow. it, you know, I, it wasn't by any necessarily fault of my parents because I think I, I, they loved me so well and I think they raised me the best they could given all the constraints of not understanding the culture, the language, you know, trying to put food on the table and pay the bills yeah. and things like that. But I think that was just something that, at a young age, I, 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 I kind of picked up on, oh, you know, the people around me were very happy when I was succeeding or doing well. And so I just wanted to do more of that. And in some ways, there was kind of the dream blueprint for a Korean American, second generation Korean American, which was go to an Ivy League. Mm -hmm. If you can pursue further education at an Ivy League, great, you know, get a high paying job. And then you mm. help your parents retire early. There was kind of, it was already laid out. And I think for most of my life up to grad school, I followed that blueprint to the T. Because you went to Harvard. I did. did. I did. Yeah, I you, did. You yes. Masters. Yeah. And did your parents ever tell you that um, specifically? Or did you feel like it was just embedded in your family culture? You just knew. Or did they actually say certain things or do certain things that made you feel like, yes, this is my life? Yeah, you know, I think th uh, there was a definitely explicit, you know, we want you to go, you know, we're doing these things so that you go to these good schools or, you know, if you don't do that, you're not going to get into an Ivy League. And then there were definitely implicit messages, cultural messages as well, you know, um, mm -hmm. that I think I just picked up on and, and internalized. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I'm feeling like a deeper connection with you um, because my parents actually moved from Malaysia to Singapore um, when I was about one year old, one year mm. old. And mm. so when you say that there's implicit and explicit kind of messages that are sent to you, I, I totally understand. Out of curiosity, what did your parents used to do in Korea and how did their lives change when they came to the States? Yeah. And you know, what's really interesting. And this was a really humbling moment in my life. Yeah. Um, in my old, I realized, I didn't realize this until I was an adult, but I had never asked my parents what they loved to do or what they did in Korea. I never asked about their life before wow. America. You know, my dad was someone in America who had a lot of different kinds of jobs. He was uh, a journalist for the Korea Times for a bit. He was a marketing analyst. He he managed wow. a, a large supermarket. My mom did dry cleaners, you know, which was a very common kind of profession for Korean immigrants. And I think as a child, I just assumed in my naivety that like, oh, that's what they always did. But mm. um, it was interesting because my mom was a French major in college. Um, mm. My dad was a classical guitar major. Um, oh, wow. and, and so... I mean, what they did coming to the States was completely different. You know, both were clearly creatives. You know, I'm sure they could have pursued kind of create creative professions, yeah. but they kind of came to the States and, and took on very, I'd say, pretty like manually intensive careers. Wow, Jason, thank you for sharing that mm. with me. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just holding back tears because... I just feel so much love that you have for your parents and mm. them for you as well. Mm. Yeah. And having all that um, 
Sorry, you're about to say something. No, I mean, I'm, I, I will say, like, I think especially in my older years, I've grown so much more to appreciate the sacrifices that they've made, you know? Yes. And, and I think, you know, maybe this will, we'll get into more of this later on. I yeah. think something that they had to, and I, I've seen this growth in them, was in some ways they had to kind of move also mature from a kind of thinking that said, we came to the States so that our kids could succeed in X, Y, and Z industries, be a doctor, yeah. a lawyer, engineer, whatever that may be. <laughs> um, but I think they had to come to a place, and this was after a lot of conversation with with my me and my brother, yeah. where we were, what we were saying to them was, your sacrifice wasn't in vain because you, you, because of your sacrifice, we actually had a choice, you know, like what you did was you, you paved the way so that we didn't, we weren't locked into a specific right. kind of career, you know, right. and um, the fact that we had that agency mm -hmm. um, to go into the industries that we did, like their sacrifice wasn't in vain. In fact, it wow. was um, the very reason why we, you know, were able to go into the fields we were able to go into. Wow. Did you ever tell them this? I did, you know, and I think wow. that that was a definitely a paradigm shifter for them as well, you know. Wow, that is powerful, Jason. Mm. I can imagine how it might have sunk in. Wow, mm -hmm. thank mm -hmm. you. And with all that in mind, like with this weight, now I, I truly feel and understand the weight of the expectations that were on your shoulders. I mean, you and your brother, how did you manage um, your parental expectations? I guess what I really want to explore is this sense of, you know, all of us have been given dreams by God, from God, that are put in our hearts. And sometimes it's so hard when the very people who have raised and loved us have different kind of ideals from us. Mm. And sometimes they may not see it. And in that moment of them not supporting your ideals or dreams or goals, I'm just wondering, how do you manage them? How did you manage them? And do you have a lessons that you glean, perhaps, for us to learn from? Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right in saying, you know, I think when you are a dreamer, naysayers almost come with the package, you yeah. know. Um, <laughs> but but it is particularly, I think, challenging when those naysayers are the people closest to you, you yes. know. Yes. And I think, especially for someone like me, I am a people pleaser by nature, you know. Yeah. I think if there was anything that I have... Oh. Been, has been a constant struggle in my life. It's this need for approval, you know, and mm. I would say, you know, I mean, where the kind of the aspect of the gospel that speaks especially profoundly to me is, mm. is a God who um, accepts me as I am and val you know, and loves me at my worst. And I think it's wow. partly because I, from a young age, I've, I've really struggled with pleasing people. And, it's interesting. Part of the reason I struggle with it so much is that for a large part of my life, I was very good at it. <laughs> you know, I was wow. I was very good at doing what people wanted me to do and mm -hmm. doing what was expected of me, which is why I think maybe when I, for the first time, wanted to try to venture out and do something that I wanted to do. So before ministry, it was music for me. And mm -hmm. when I wanted to venture out and do music, I think it came as as like doubly a shock for a lot of people around me. And I think the resistance was that much greater because it almost oh. felt like me, uh, my pursuing my dreams was like an act of rebellion, you know, because yeah. you're talking about a son who kind of did everything by the book. And, yeah. you know, and so I think to, you know, the first time I let my parents and my some of my closest friends know I was, going to kind of leave behind this Ivy League education to become a starving artist, <laughs> you know, I think there was a lot of resistance, you know, yeah. and I think, you know, I'm definitely one of those people who I do take what um, I do often really pay attention to what the people closest to me say to me, you know, that is always a part of any kind of discernment process that I have, yeah. you know, I always... Um, you know, even when I advise people in our community, I always talk about the three-legged chair, 
um, of mm. decisions. And I always say, you know, there's an internal affirmation, this real sense that the spirit, you know, is calling you to something where, mm -hmm. you know, between you and God, you really feel like, huh, like I, I feel the Holy Spirit leading me in this direction. There's wow. the external affirmation, which is asking the people that you really trust has your best mm -hmm. interest in mind, who know you to ask them what they think. And then right. the third leg being opportunity, you know, um, wow. are the doors open or closed, you know, and um, wow. obviously it's not a foolproof method, yeah. but a lot of times when all three of those things align, um, generally I, I say that's a really good kind of indicator, you know, that wow. um, you are kind of moving in God's will for your life. And so on some level, like external affirmation, that is a big piece for me. So I, I don't want to say that like when I, you know, when the, those naysayers came that I immediately disregarded them and just went with like my heart. Cause that was always a big deal for me. And especially for me, that was all external affirmation was almost everything, you know? Wow. And I think there were two things that I, one, I, I would say that I did, um, when that, when I felt like there was a dissonance between my kind of what I felt God was calling me to and what I felt like some of the people around me were saying. Mm -hmm. One was really broadening um, the people that I was talking to about it, you know, um, because I realized that especially with a decision like this, mm -hmm. sometimes the closest people to you, they are, they're naysaying, not because they don't see the gift or they don't see the right. call on your life, but because mm -hmm. they're also afraid. You know, nobody loves me more than my parents. And I know that for them, as people who struggled themselves, who at some points were living paycheck to paycheck, I know that wow. the idea of their son who has all this education choosing to be a starving artist, you know, there is like a, a kind of a grief that sets in too, you know? Um, and yeah, so sure. mm -hmm. I think that I had to kind of like also walk through, huh, like I wonder what might be fueling kind of their resistance. You know, wow. um, and that helped me, especially in those seasons to not resent my parents or not resent mm -hmm. um, my closest friends, to know that a lot of kind of their resistance was also coming from a place of love and genuine yeah. care, you know. Wow. And so that helped me place certain things in perspective. But that's where I kind of mm -hmm. had to really broaden, huh? like, let me talk to a few people who may not be who I, I can trust just as much, but may not be as maybe invested in, you know, my quote unquote financial well-being or, you know. Um, and so I remember calling up different pastors, other mentors, even people who had taken similar leaps of faith, right. you know, and, you know, I had really had to like do my due diligence because I think the internal affirmation felt so clear and so wow. strong. Wow. You know, and yeah, I do think that, you know, that was that was really huge for me. And I think it um, helped me navigate all the all their kind of reservations and concerns um, mm -hmm. in a healthy way. Wow, mm -hmm. Jason, th that was that was amazing. There's so much to unpack there. And as you were speaking, I was just writing, taking down some notes because I think you shared a couple of really useful handles. And the first mm -hmm. thing um, that I wrote down was understand the context of where mm. your parents or your mentors are coming from because that then helps you distill what their fears or concerns or anxieties might be. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing that you did, which I wrote down, was to um, broaden your mentorship mm. but also finding the right mentors because I think you and I both know that sometimes asking more people can um, be more frustrating at times yes. because yeah. people can tell you <laughs> just a, such a variety of what they think and sometimes it leaves you more confused than ever but as you were mm -hmm. sharing I kind of wrote down in brackets broaden broaden your mentorship community but also find the right mentors mm. so as you were sharing um, about um, finding role models that was actually the third point that I wrote down so find role models who have actually walked your path so that you're not just making a foolhardy decision, mm -hmm. but that you're actually um, thinking through this. And this is so helpful for me because I feel uh, we're kind of in a different kind of crossroads. You know, we're making the move to Tanzania in just yeah. a couple of weeks. And it's just interesting how, um, yeah, different people have very different thoughts. And one question I had for you is really, um, 
you know, it's one thing to discern um, when when people take cheap shots at you. Mm. That that's easy. But how do you discern good, solid advice mm. from well intentioned advice that may not quite be God's will for us? Mm. Yeah, are there some guiding principles in your life that? can really help you when you're in that space of fog and haze and just trying to uh, piece together and make sense of that dissonance that you feel. Yeah, that's that's a great mm. point. And, you know, I think for me, a lot of times what I what I realize is first, I have to make sure I think that I'm maybe in a place where I can truly receive that advice in a healthy way. And I guess what I mean by that is it's interesting where I can receive the same advice from two different people, but depending kind of on the state of my relationship with God or mm-hmm. or kind of where my soul is at that moment, I might receive it in very different ways. You know, and mm-hmm. I think for me, it's a lot about, I think for me, it has been actually a lot of my own self-regulation and, you know, really firmly rooting my identity and security in Christ first mm. so that I think when well-intentioned people, because because if that is not the case and if I'm coming to a person and I'm in a very already a very insecure place or I'm already kind of like seeking their approval or I'm already, I feel a little bit not grounded, um, that mm-hmm. advice, no matter how, how should I say this? No matter how wrong I think it is, it mm-hmm. will it will usually shake me, you know, and it will right. um, often kind of take me off the path. Wow. And so for me, it has been more about knowing that that advice is always going to come from very mm-hmm. well-intentioned people. But it's like, how mm-hmm. am I preparing myself to receive that advice from others? You know, how am I putting myself in a place of security, putting myself, um, rooting myself, rooting my identity in Christ? So that I can actually receive that advice, take the things that are really good, but also be able to discern, you know, what may not be helpful or what may be even bad advice, you know? Wow. Wow. As you're saying that, Jason, I'm I'm just thinking our listeners might be thinking, what does it mean to anchor your identity in God? I totally get what you're saying, though, because like even with this move to Tanzania, we've had so many pieces of well-intentioned advice like you know it's not good for your kids not good for your future not good for your career I mean they all make sense Mm. it's all super well-intentioned like you said Um, but maybe what has helped me over the years to anchor my identity in God if that's what you're saying is that sense of hearing or feeling the the clarity of God's call Mm. on your life like you said that internal affirmation and for me it has been such a journey it has taken Mm -hmm. me years actually to get here and for you how has it looked like? What does anchoring your identity in God mean? Because you you, are, you shared with me that you spent all your life hearing all these messages from your parents that you have to go to mm-hmm. Ivy League, you got to make it in life. And then suddenly you have this creative call to music and then another call to ministry, which is like, whoa, and another shocker, you know, a second one. That's right. How do you find your identity, anchor your identity in God? What was that yeah. process like for you? Mm. I mean... One, I think, um, engaging in the spiritual practices, you know, and um, oh. um, incorporating rhythms into my life that allow me to live into the reality that I'm a child of God. So, for example, it's one thing to say, God doesn't require anything of me and, you know, he loves me as I am. It's one thing to say that. But, for example, mm-hmm. um, when I in- began to incorporate Sabbath into my life, you know, I started to see Sabbath not as a rule to keep, but really as a such a gift where I can actually experience the gospel in an embodied way. So what I mean by that is when I set aside 24 hours to just do nothing and not be productive and not perform and not achieve, and mm-hmm. often some things put have to put some things till tomorrow and yeah. I can just be, I get to live into the reality that God does not love me for my performance or my productivity or my achievement, but he, wow. he loves me exactly as I am. You know, so that's Sabbath is one kind of way I've been able to live into that. Silence and solitude is another uh, practice that I started incorporating into my prayer life. 
partly mm-hmm. because I realized even the way that I was praying, I was still trying to like pray to get something from God or pray to impress God. Wow. So silence and solitude now, I open all my times of prayer just sitting even for five minutes in complete stillness. And, oh. you know, uh, one of my favorite quotes is when they say that the, the heart of prayer is looking at God, looking at you in love. And oh. um, when I, I think when I am just silent and I don't right. even speak a word and I just can sit, that is another way I get to live into that reality, you know. Wow. Jason, this is really mind-blowing because as you're speaking, this is such a paradigm shift, I think, for myself and many others that when we think about, you know, how do I manage the naysayers or the, the mentors or parents who don't agree with my dreams, we're looking outwards. Hmm. And yet right now you are telling me and telling us that actually the most important thing is to anchor yourself in God Mm. and by engaging in the spiritual practices, by deepening our spiritual identities, our formation in Christ, that's where the true revelation comes in. Mm. Because Mm -hmm. when you hear God so clearly, then nothing can really shake you. Yes. And then you can really discern the wheat from the shave more easily. Yes. Yes. Wow. Wow. Jason, that that was so good. Thank you. Mm. You know, before I interview, something Cliff and I did also was to um, watch your youngest, your your, your younger brother's um, latest movie, The Greatest <laughs> Hits. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So we watched that, and you know, something that came across my mind was your your parents had to go through this maybe shock with you mm. twice yes. with the music, and then the full-time ministry, and then with your brother also. <laughs> yes, I often say that we, the, between the two of us, we have covered the forbidden trifecta of Korean immigrant parents, which is ministry, <laughs> music, and, and acting. <laughs> that is so funny. Oh my goodness. And I guess what I'm really interested to know is, you know, how, how do you manage opposition and critique from people you respect, like parents or mentors? Because... And I, I really wanted to ask you because you're like in the intersection of this kind of Western individualism uh, kind of culture. And yet also, I mean, I'm sure your Korean culture and your values are still so close and dear to your heart. And when mm. your parents say like, did they, well, I mean, what did they say when, when you and Justin pursued such different paths? And how did you manage that? Because they love you so much and you also love them, right? <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, it's interesting tricky. because with my brother, you know, his story is really interesting because when he was first, I think it was an even bigger shock when my brother went into acting because, mm. well, one, it didn't seem like that was where his life trajectory was heading. It did feel a little bit out of left field. Wow. And then for five years... There is there are few things more kind of demoralizing than Hollywood, you know, in the sense wow. of especially when you're when you're just starting out. And he was mm-hmm. living with um, our family, you know, and I think my parents saw that and it was kind of like like my brother was a Cornell graduate. So he, too, went to Ivy League and wow. my parent was my parents were kind of like, here you are living still living with your brother and just going to these auditions and you know and and they would call me all the time and they would say you know (laughs) he's not gonna listen to us but he'll listen to you please knock some sense into him you know and it's interesting you know this i think if my brother more than anyone really did have to face a lot of naysayers, you know, yeah. because when you go to, when you're experiencing rejection after rejection after rejection, yeah. you know, you have a lot of people around you at some point being like, you know, are you sure you want to keep doing this? Yeah. And and the thing about acting that maybe is different from, you know, music and ministry even, like, you know, even though this isn't the way that I think we should ever assess like someone's success in music or ministry like in music you can still play for a small club of 10 people yeah and you can people can still kind of see your talent Mm -hmm. 
and they can just say he or she just hasn't gotten the right opportunity. Right. Um, in ministry, like maybe like, you know, your church isn't a mega church and, yeah. you know, not that it, you need to have a mega church in any way, but mm-hmm. you can still preach whether your church is 10 people, sure. 20 people, 500 people, you know? Mm-hmm. But the thing that is so challenging about acting, you know, is that nobody sees your auditions and nobody really can watch you act unless you get book something, you know? Wow. And so oh my. it's right. it's a lot of kind of these oh unknowns and it's, you know, because people can't see it there, it's much <sighs> more easy to say, hey, I think it's time to move on. You know, right, all they can... Right. All they know about you is that you haven't gotten a role, you know? Oh, and so, my. you know, my brother during that time, though, paradoxically, I would say that was probably the most vibrant. Um, if he would probably point to that season as the as the time that fo- cultivated the most intimacy with him and God, you know? Um, wow. At the time, he was serving as a college uh, director at our church, you know, wow. um, I know that because, you know, as they say, um, you know, you never know Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. And yeah. I think during that time, really, he he was completely stripped of, you know, his pride, his, you know, self-sufficiency, you know, yeah. like so much of acting, you're, you put your kind of fate into someone else's hands, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so... I think going back to what we talked about before, I think he really had to anchor his identity in Christ during that season Mm -hmm. in order to fight and resist all the naysayers, you know, and then by God's grace, all it took was one open door. And now he kind of, he's hit the ground running and, and he's doing great for himself. And, you know, my parents are, it's funny, my parents um, yeah, you know, <laughs> that's now. He's yeah. a Hollywood star, and you're a you're a you know a, a pastor of a huge church that many people talk about. It's funny, my, especially with my brother. You know, it seems yeah. like they forgot when they wanted him to quit. Um, <laughs> now I read a lot of their posts, and and they talk about how they've always <laughs> known that this was his path. You know, um, and we just laugh at it. You know, my both my brother and I, we laugh at it, but yeah. Wow. But but you know, um, Jason, what you shared is such a treasure because it goes to show again how important that internal affirmation, that compass is going back to the spiritual practices, going back to the theme of, you know, cultivating that spiritual intimacy that your brother did when he was feeling rejected and soul searching. And again, when when you share that, you know, you lean on Sabbath and silence and solitude to find your anchor in God, because it seems like many years later, after you walk through that dark tunnel, and when you finally see that glimmer of hope and light, at the end of the day, you have to account to yourself what you did with your life. Yes. And the interesting thing is how naysayers can flip the switch so easily. Mm-hmm. Right? And mm-hmm. you don't want to go, you don't want to live your life in such a way where we're pleasing all the naysayers or mentors or authorities in our lives and realizing that we're just living with a, with a hole in our hearts. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I think when I look back at what you shared, it's almost as if it's a reminder of how important it is to respect to love um the mentors and parents and authorities in our lives understanding that context and i think that that helps us to manage them as well but at the same time you're also saying to lean into what god has for us yes and this and if is you're where... faithful to that then yeah. something happens yeah go ahead no absolutely and i i would say that this is where kind of understanding the stories and narratives that have shaped you in your specific context is so important because you're right. Maybe um, in a completely Western individualistic culture where it kind of you've been taught, you know, you do you pursue what you want. Yeah. Maybe for that person, the thing they need to lean into more is community and you know, um, mentorship and things like that. But I think especially when when we're talking about someone like me, you know, a a second generation Korean American who's already going to be bent toward like sacrificing maybe our dreams to to honor, you know, my elders or to do to kind of like 
you know, as someone who naturally I think is inclined to be more beholden to family expectation, I might have to lean more into kind of where I feel like God is calling me. And so this is where I do feel like understanding your own narrative and your own kind of experience is so important. Wow, that's so good, Jason. If I could just round this off, you know, how has social media Hmm. complicated how we receive and process feedback or comments about our lives or pursuit of our dreams? Because, I mean, you're a public figure. Clearly, a lot of what you do, the choices that you make, um, they're seen by people. How do you manage some of this feedback? Especially when you know that, you know, as a pastor or as somebody that people respect and look up to, what people say is important. And yet, you also know that hmm, sometimes it can be tricky to know what to take in and what not to. Yeah, I mean, social yeah. media, I think, has really <laughs> complicated things for everyone. You know, <laughs> on one hand, I think for the individual themselves, I mean, to now be bombarded by by people who are succeeding and mm. or at least perceived to be succeeding, you know, mm. I think the comparison game is very high. And so mm. I think right off the bat, there is a sense sometimes I can see a lot of people not pursuing or stepping into what they feel like God is calling them to because they're seeing all these people supposedly doing it better or different, you know, mm. or, you know, you, you begin to believe that, oh, maybe I'm not built for this, you know, because you're seeing mm. all these. And I think there there's that challenge. And then the second is, of course, like yeah. all the kind of Criticisms. keyboard warriors yeah the criticism yeah. and yeah. you know it's it's interesting like you almost know that you've reached a certain level of influence <laughs> you know when, when you get when those. you when you get haters <laughs> you know because i think at the beginning it's a lot of your friends and family commenting or or you know having you know it's all affirmations but i think <laughs> yeah in some ways um and i i think there is like a healthy kind of you know, I think as as people, one thing is one thing I never want to be closed off to is is feedback. You know, mm, and true. I never want to kind of, yeah, I I, I never want to just assume that all feedback online is bad feedback. You know, sure. But it's like, how do you keep that feedback from now becoming a lie that gets repeated in your mind or becomes a narrative that defines you? Yeah. Um, or I think keeps you. And I think, so one, I think there is a huge discernment process that has to happen with like, who is this person yeah. giving you this feedback, you know, and mm -hmm. asking yourself, you know, is this, is this a trusted source at all? And I think with most of social media, a lot of times these are people who don't really know your story, don't mm -hmm. even know what you're trying to do, don't mm -hmm. know all the different experiences that have happened to get you to this place. Mm -hmm. And so kind of taking things, certain things with a grain of salt, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you know, being always open, because I do think maybe if let's say there's a recurring feedback that happens, you know, I do think the Holy Spirit also works mm -hmm. in mysterious ways yeah. and can kind of reveal certain blind spots. But again, mm -hmm. I think our ability to navigate and and receive and embrace that feedback, like the good of the feedback and reject the bad, so much of mm. that is going to come from our own relationship with God. Wow. Wow, Jason, I'm just taking notes as you were sharing. Um, and I think the first point you mentioned is understand or recognize who it is that is mm -hmm. speaking to you. The second mm -hmm. thing that you wrote was um, take it with a grain of salt. And actually, I'll, I'll add a little bit of mine here. You said grain of salt. I'll say grain of truth. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. recently I've been reading this book called um, Managing Leadership Anxiety by Steve Kuss. And Love he talks about book. how... Oh, yay. Okay. <laughs> so good. I'm going to ask you for book recommendations <laughs> next. But um, he was just talking about how for every piece of feedback that he gets, he looks for the grain of truth in it. And you no, know, even if it's a keyboard warrior, even if it's somebody, he just try. He just tries to look for that one grain of truth in it, and wow. take it, take it positively. And I love what you said because the next thing you said was um, to look for patterns and blind spots, mm -hmm. and take in the good but reject the bad. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe that's the the grain of salt, grain of truth kind of balance that that we have together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, you yeah. know I think we can only almost do that. Yeah 
yeah. when we can get to a place where that criticism or that feedback doesn't define us, you know, when we exactly. are secure in our identity. You know? Yeah. So again, going back to your theme of being anchored in Christ mm. and those spiritual um, practices that mm -hmm. you shared with us. And mm -hmm. also one thing I wanted to add was um, you shared with us about um, looking for themes and the patterns. And I think that's so important. And maybe one thing I thought that, I, I mean, I, I, that I've learned recently is also to come to the right conclusion. Because yeah. after, the, after the US book tour, what happened was that I, I, I found myself in this season receiving a lot of this online kind of feedback. And then I got really insecure. I, I felt like, wow, like, like there's a recurring theme of that, you know, when I post something on social media, there's, there's, this, there's this pushback. And, and I, I came to this conclusion um, at one point to say that maybe I shouldn't engage in social media so much or I shouldn't mm -hmm. engage in it for this season of my life whatever and Cliff was like oh my goodness that is totally the wrong conclusion mm. like can you not see that the conclusion is that and this is actually something that um, I listened to Christine Kane when I was at the conference in the States the same time that I was speaking at a citizen's church mm. um, and it was this she said something along the lines of to the extent that you're able to receive disappointment and criticism is the extent you'll be effective in public ministry. It's mm, good. And when I when I heard that from her and from Cliff, I realized that man, I've come to the wrong conclusion. <laughs> mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. In in some yeah. ways, I think it's more the in some ways the negative feedback that actually can refine our calling, yeah. you know, so and, true. and 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 purify our calling. Because yeah, I think yeah. when those things happen. If you are in it for the approval, yeah, immediately those things will expose it. Because yeah. when you say like, "Oh, I don't want to do this anymore," then it's like, yeah. "Oh, were you doing it so that you could make everyone happy?" You know? Wow! Um, oh my, um, Jason, that is deep. Yeah, but you know, Ooh. but but when you receive it and you can say, you know, that really hurts, but I really feel like God is calling me to this. It in some ways wow. it strengthens your calling. You know, clarifies it. Oh, that is so good, Jason. Wow. Thank you for ending on that note. Hmm. Wow. Today's episode was just mind-blowing. I think um, the greatest thing that I took away from you was the importance of, um, you know, understanding this three-legged stool that you talked about, you know, hmm. the, um, the, the internal affirmation, the external affirmation opportunity, and yet understanding the need for being anchored in Christ hmm. through spiritual practices and formation. Because that is ultimately our guiding compass. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Jason, before I end this episode, uh, I love to ask all our guests some questions. And mm -hmm. the first thing is, what's a book title you'd recommend our listeners to read? One book that has helped me for that exact thing that you're talking about, anchoring yeah. our identity in Christ, is, yeah. is Strengthening the Soul of Our Leadership by Ruth Haley Barton. I have read that book too. I love that book. I love and that. that yeah. yeah, that actually was a such an important book for me in a time when I did feel very kind of shaky and, and you know I, I didn't feel grounded at all and that was a, a book that really encouraged me so I would recommend that I'm so glad and she also has a host of other books on uh, spiritual practices invitation yes. to retreat oh, yes. thank you for that Jason and what is one intentional practice you do or that you would recommend to help keep um, our listeners or your dreams on track hmm Align um, with God. Yeah, I mean, one very simple one that I mentioned earlier in, in the episode was silence and solitude. Especially, wow. I think, when we are, I think in our culture, especially yeah. in the Western, kind of our, our addiction to productivity, we yeah. even try to, we, we try to be even productive in our relationship with God and our pursuit of our calling. And I think, yeah, you know what do you I mean, mean? Do you mean, let me take the Sabbath so that I'll be more fruitful tomorrow? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I think, you know, for a Sabbath I know is, 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 can be very difficult. And I think you can work up to that. But in the morning, spending just a couple few moments and just being, you know, and just sitting in the presence of God, I think has been so transformative for me. Wow. And so, mm -hmm. That's good, Jason. Thank you. And the last one, dream brave because... Because that's, God, that's who God has called us to be. Wow, that's so good. 
Jason, thank you so much for coming on to the Dream Brave podcast. It was such a blessing and privilege to speak with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Wow, I love that conversation with Jason. Wasn't that amazing? If you know an ordinary Christian with extraordinary faith whom you'd love to hear me interview, or if that person's you, please let me know. Just drop me a note at hello at kitedreams.org. Be blessed.